Hi there, and welcome to Mendel Plays. In this episode of my All Achievements or Bust Run of Oxygen Not Included, I'm going to be talking about setting up the framework for a few different mid-game systems that are vital to transitioning into more late-game builds. There are three frameworks that I'm going to be talking about here. The first is setting up Radbolt production through what is commonly known as a Shinebug reactor. The second is my temporary solution for the production of steel that makes use of my cool slush geyser. And the third is the first steps to building my steam room, which is where steel production and other high heat machinery will be housed permanently. In order to advance technology in ONI, there's four different kinds of research that you need to do. The first research you can do at the beginning of the game. It uses a research station, which requires dirt, in order to achieve basic technology upgrades. The second is also pretty easy to get early in the game, which uses the supercomputer that requires water to feed it, that allows you to get into more intermediate technologies in the game. The third and fourth type of research takes a little bit longer to achieve because of what's required to achieve that research. The one that I'm setting up here, which is the materials research station, requires rad bolts to fuel it. There's various ways to produce rad bolts. The method that I'm using here is to create what's called a shinebug reactor. The main positive to using a shinebug reactor is that as the game goes on, the amount of rad bolts that you produce per cycle can grow infinitely. The main negative is that a shinebug reactor relies upon having a lot of shinebugs in a very small space, and the more critters that you add to your game, then the more resources the game requires to keep up with all the critters that you have. So if you have an old computer or an old graphics card, or if you're planning on running your game for multiple thousands of cycles that explores every single inch of the star map, a shinebug reactor is going to contribute to your whole game bogging down. This is me carving out the area where I'm going to put the shinebug reactor pretty much directly above where my materials research station is. What I'm building here is a box that has one side that's completely open, a door that makes it easier to drop or grab anything from the square where the shine bugs are going to live, and then regular tiles for the rest. It's important to have it not completely enclosed because if it was, then the shine bugs inside of that space would view it as a very small room and feel overcrowded, and that would not allow them to lay eggs in that space. You contain the shine bugs in that square by having water in the open space of that square. Shine bugs can't travel through water, so it keeps them in that square without perceiving that the room is closed, which prevents overcrowding. Shine bugs don't live that long, but they always will drop one egg during their lifetime so long as they aren't overcrowded. So the way to add more shine bugs to the square is to have a separate room that acts as your shine bug ranch. You can then use the miniature version of the incubator setup to both have shine nymph eggs hatch faster and also control the population by having excess shine nymph eggs travel to the square of the shine bug reactor. If you're not familiar with how you can leverage incubators to help control your critter population, I recommend you go back and watch my previous episode, which I will link in the upper right hand corner right now. The power requirements needed for all of this to run smoothly between the Radbolt generator, the materials research station, the conveyor loaders, the auto sweepers, and the incubators was such that I needed to create a new power grid to ensure that I didn't overload any of the circuits that I had existing. While I was in the middle of this setup, I saw that one of my dupes made a mess. This is because I forgot that I added some thimble reed to my incubator room to feed the cuddle pip, so the normally closed loop of my plumbing system that normally produces a little bit of excess water, that excess water and then some was being routed to my thimble reeds. So I needed to add an additional water source to compensate for that. I had plenty of water in my main pool, so it was a pretty easy plumbing reroute in order to get that to happen. Once I finished fixing that, I went back to doing the final finishing touches on my incubator room and my whole Shinebug reactor setup, including reconfiguring some of my power grid to take away the old power transformers and replacing it with large power transformer grids. Once I had the Shinebug reactor area ready to go, I started to deconstruct the ladders that led up to that. Because once the Shinebug reactor really starts cooking, it becomes extremely hazardous for the dupes to be around because of the amount of radiation. The second build that I did during this time period was to set up a temporary location for the metal refinery so I could start to produce steel. Steel is a very important material for later advanced builds because of its high overheat temperature. 
you make steel using a metal refinery. The metal refinery produces steel by using carbon, iron, and a liquid coolant. Any liquid that goes into a metal refinery comes out much hotter than when it came in. Here, I'm taking advantage of the liquid that comes out so cold out of the cool slush geyser. I route some of that liquid into the metal refinery, and then recycle it back into the larger pool of very cold liquid. That does raise the temperature of the pool overall, but as more super cold liquid erupts out of the geyser, it helps keep the temperature from going completely out of control. Because the metal refinery requires 1200 watts to run, I expanded my power network to ensure that I wouldn't get overloaded wires. Here you can see the various states of temperature that's coming from the cold water pool and the heat that results from the kiln, which produces carbon from coal, and the metal refinery itself. I also decided at some point to remake the pipe that was recycling back into the pool into insulated pipe to prevent the heat from getting too far into the atmosphere outside of where I wanted it in the cold water pool. As the cold water pool started to really warm up into more temperate temperatures, I had to mess around with the values that would allow the liquid pump to be activated and pump liquid both to the metal refinery and also to the desalinator. Because the exit rate of the liquid was going slower than what was being produced out of the geyser, I was in danger of the geyser stopping its eruption because it was submerged in its own liquid. So I decided to build some liquid storage containers to transfer some of the excess and keep the geyser erupting at its full rate. You can see that beneath the last liquid reservoir, I have built a mechanical airlock that's connected to a signal switch. This is because you can see here that my main water pool is already pretty full. So if I kept the desalinator running the entire time, there's a chance that that water pool would actually overflow. If I open the mechanical airlock that removes the floor from the liquid reservoir, which means that while liquid can still enter the liquid reservoir, it will not exit. At some point in the future, I'll probably change this automation to run itself, as opposed to me having to monitor it and turn the signal switch manually on and off. The last build that I started on during this time period was a place to house more permanently my metal refinery along with other high heat machinery. This is done in the form of a steam room, an enclosed space that is only steam, that gets hotter due to use of the machinery, gets sucked in by steam turbines, and then gets re-spit out at lower temperatures. This is one of the most essential and effective ways to delete heat from your base. I'll be going over more specifics about this in a different form in my next episode. Using water for the liquid lock is not the best approach. I would have preferred to use either crude oil or petroleum, but this was the only liquid that I had at the time to deal with the initial setup. Once I enclosed the space completely, the next step was to remove all of the atmosphere. I wanted to get it done quickly, so I installed four gas pumps that were spaced throughout the room. The maximum capacity that a gas pump can take in is one half of what can exist within a singular gas pipe. This is why I joined the pipes from two of the gas pumps together to save on having to build more high pressure vents. All the power grids that I currently had were occupied enough that adding these gas pumps would have potentially caused a circuit overload. I needed to create a new power grid with a new large power transformer and I took the opportunity to restage where I currently had my hydrogen generator. I did this because you can see directly beneath where my current smart battery and hydrogen generator was is a hydrogen vent and in order for me to properly tame the hydrogen vent I needed to use some of the space that that area currently occupied. After moving the hydrogen generator and the smart battery over, I started to carve out the area that I needed in order to be able to tame this hydrogen vent. I'm going to be devoting about half of next episode to the taming of this hydrogen vent, which I am really looking forward to sharing. For now though, that just about does it. I hope you found this useful. If you have any questions or feedback, I welcome your comments below. If you like what I'm doing with this content, I have several ways that you can support me listed in the video description. Thanks so much for watching and indulging me on my on and off YouTube ONI journey. Insert your standard like and subscribe ask here, and please always feel free to tell me your story, because no matter who you are, I would definitely love to hear it.